You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. So he had, he got stabbed, um, top shoulder, pierced his lung, uh, in the side as well, pierced his other lung, got hit overhead with a scaffolding bar, um, kicked and punched. So my, my dad's 6'3", so he's quite a big guy. So as a child, I always looked up to him. He's quite a scary guy, you know, uh, being so tall and so big and stuff. And yeah, he, he, he was in absolute bits, couldn't really speak. Um, all he could say to me was go and speak to your mum upstairs. And I went upstairs and spoke to my mum and my mum told me. Even the two that were convicted are still saying, no involvement, it wasn't us, you guys have set us up. But, you know what I mean? But all those connotations, so there is no exception of guilt from them two, um, which I find really hard to, to accept, but they are who they are. <sighs> Boom, we're on. Yeah. And today's the guest. We've got Stuart Lawrence. How Thank are you, Stuart? Nice boy? to meet you, James. Yeah, really nice to meet you. Thanks for giving us your time. No worries. Pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Yeah. It's uh, your brother, Stephen Lawrence's murder was nearly 30 years ago. Yeah. One probably one of the most spoke about murders in British history. Like, um, tragic event, unprovoked uh, racial murder, which is uh, still spoke about to this day. And obviously, this is why you're here to yeah. shed more light on it and everything that you, your mum, everybody's battled through over yeah. the years trying to get justice. But... First and foremost, brother, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah. Um, just sort of getting back up to speed with work. Um, just appreciating me working and being out there, really, and just trying to do my little thing. So, yeah, never complain. Just try to get my head down and just get on with it. Yeah, that's the best way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. definitely. But before we get into everything, obviously, we'll get a bit about your own background, yeah. where you grew up and how it all began. Yeah. Uh, so, I lived in Woolwich, South East London, from... As far back as I can remember, I think we were about five. We moved from like a little council flat into a house, uh, the house that my dad actually worked on in a house and estate called Woolwich Common Estate. Uh, and then we lived there till we was 16, 17. And yeah, just had a great childhood. Uh, local community, went to the local school, um, just knew everyone, enjoyed the time. We had a big commons, like a big green area where we just go, ride our bikes, play football enjoy ourselves the fun fair used to come circus used to come just enjoyed life really yeah, yeah so a pretty decent life yeah definitely <clears throat> mum and dad come from jamaica mum and dad come to jamaica so my dad came over when he was first when he was about 18 did two years as a, a holstra so and then he went back for three and then came back again and um i always ask him like why did you come back for like because like if you've ever been to jamaica like the weather the food, the people, the culture is just amazing. And he said he wanted to try and give us a better, better opportunity than he had, a better first start, um, which makes sense in my head. Like, it did make sense. And, um, yeah, my mum came from Clarendon. Uh, she came over when she was a bit later uh, and came to school over here. And they met over here and got married and had us three kids. And, yeah, life was good. Yeah. Life was How good. is um, your schooling? Good. I, um, so I went to a school called Eglinton <coughs> Primary School, which was – about two or three minutes where we live from where we live so we walked to school every day my mum worked at the local school as well um yeah school was great like there was never no problems or issues at school um and like the demographic mix wasn't wasn't great but it was never an issue so like looking back now in primary school there was me as a black child there was an, an indian child and there was another black girl there but again the race was never something we spoke about or divided each other amongst ourselves about um and then i went to secondary school so <clears throat> i went to the same secondary school as stephen did um for the first year and that was a predominantly black school uh in blackheath called blackheath blue coats um i just didn't get on i was a bit of a rebel um lots of teachers telling me oh you're like why are you not like stephen why you don't behave as like why are you, <laughs> why are you not as clever as stephen is uh so that messed with my head for a while and, and i rebelled a bit and was a bit naughty and yeah, I had to move school. Um, I went from a mixed school to an all-boys school in Eaglesfield in Woolwich. Again, so I could walk to school every day. And I'd settled in a lot better. The, the idea of just going to school to learn and play football 
was great for me. I really enjoyed that environment. Um, I enjoyed school, going to school as well. But again, school wasn't a very diverse, mixed school that I went to. Uh, so there was me, another black child. There was a dual heritage kid in my class. Uh, there was a Chinese kid in my class. But across the whole school, it wasn't a very mixed school. But again, we was never divided up because of colour. No one ever made me feel because I was black, I couldn't do certain things or I had to be marginalised anyway. It was never a thing. It was more about, could you play football? Um, how, what kind of clothes and trainers did you have on? Like how like that sort of coolness was the measure of people back then. Um, yeah, so life, life was good. Life was good back as, as a yeah. child. It really was. What was the age difference between yourself and Stephen? Two and a half years. So still very close. Yeah, yeah. So we shared a room from age of five together. My sister came along and we lived in a three-bedroom house. So me and Stephen shared. My sister had a room by myself. My mum and dad had a room together. So yeah, we shared a room from the age of five. So really close. Like I say to people, like anyone that's had a sibling and, and goes to sleep and wakes up and that's the first person you sleep and the last person you go, it's like that, it's that bond is, is quite unbreakable. Yeah. So, so what did you do? Did you, were you still at school when the incident of Stephen happened? So I was at Eaglesfield, yeah. So I was I was just about to do my GCSEs when Stephen passed away. Uh, Stephen was doing his A-levels, and that was a mixture between Blackheath, Blue Coats, and a few other little colleges around Woolwich. Um, yeah, so I, it, was, it was a week after my birthday, my 16th birthday, Stephen was killed. Yeah, that must all affect your birthdays then to this day, brother there. Yeah, it's a weird one because it's I have my birthday, and then I have a week where I know... It's coming up to Stephen's memorial, yeah. and then we have another week, and it's Georgina's birthday, my sister. So it's smack bang in the middle of both our birthdays. Um, so yeah, birthdays, birthdays and Christmas, or any special family celebrations, then has its own sort of like tint and jade on it, mm -hmm. and going forward from then on. Yeah. So obviously you're still at school at the time, and then obviously with Stephen's murder, 1993. Yeah. Was it 22nd April? Yeah. And then. Um, how old was Stephen? 19? 18. 18. Yeah. So only 18 years old. Like, yeah. out of his, was it his cousin or his friend? That he's with. Yeah. Yeah, his friend, yeah. Is that, is that Dwayne? Dwayne Brooks. Brooks, yeah. Yeah. Playing the computer, going home, and then an unprovoked attack. Yeah. Uh, racial abuse. And then, was it two stab wounds? So it was more uh, about three or four. So he, ha he got stabbed, um, top shoulder, pierced his lung, uh, in the side as well, pierced his other lung got hit overhead with a scaffolding bar um kicked and punched as well and um yeah the, the, the main reason why so the couple of reasons why he, he actually passed away was because after he was stabbed and and, and hit over the head he, he got up and his friend had came back for him and then told him to run so he then ran another 100 meters up the road so obviously that that the running sped everything up and then he collapsed and it was only when he collapsed, his friend realised that he had been stabbed. Uh, and then where they he collapsed, from, there was a church across the road, which had just finished doing midnight, was sort of, uh, not midnight mass, was just finished doing evening mass. So uh, a couple came out uh, from the church, saw him on the floor and came and gave him a bit of aid and, and a bit of respite and tried to kind of make him feel as comfortable while the ambulance was supposed to be coming. How long did it take for the ambulance to come? Um... Well, where he, he where he st got stabbed, the, uh, the hospital was only less than ten minutes away. Um, but I think the police turned up first um, because the, when Dwayne phoned up, he was quite erratic, um, and and we later found out with any sort of incidents like that, if the if the person's not quite as calm, and the police will always turn up first, and then the, the emergency services will come after the police. So he must have been there for about ten minutes before the police turned and um, the ambulance turned up. And when the police showed up, they never done any CPR. Did I read that correctly? Like, yeah. They never tried to stop any no, bleeding? No, Why? Um, you have to ask them that. You know, I, I didn't find this out until 2011 when uh, we was at the Old Bailey and uh, the officers first on scene were being interviewed and, and questioned. And that was when the question was asked of them, why they didn't take the first aid kit out of the back and perform any CPR. Um, and they said that they were more concerned about how distressed Dwayne was and trying to find out what was going on, what had happened during the incident. And um, yeah, that, that again is, is another, another sort of layer of, of people's consciousness, I do believe, about if you see someone, if you're a first aider, I know as of myself as a first aider, if I see someone in need of first aid, 
but it's my duty to go and try and do the best I can until the emergency services turn up. And then when the emergency turn, services turn up, then allow them to carry on. Yeah. So th th those sort of things are really hard to comprehend and understand the layers of people's mindset back then. Because I think there was an investigation. They didn't even know CPR. They weren't even trained. Like, Well... But even if there's a gash with yeah, blood coming out, saying, the first yeah, thing you do yeah, is try yeah, and yeah. cover it to try and stop yeah, the blood, which yeah. can probably prolong your life maybe an extra five, ten minutes. Enough 100%, 100%. time to then. Yeah. If you, even if you don't know CPR, the most basic idea in your mind is is to try and stop the bleeding, mm -hmm. try to stop the the wound from leaking any more blood, or to slow it down as possible, to then to allow the emergency services to come in and do their job. Yeah. So if, from that, it's just a kind of it's just question marks everywhere from for yourself and your family just straight away no not not from the beginning part not the beginning part because again we 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 thought at the first sort of like five or six weeks that the process was just the process we had never been involved with the police we never had involvement with the police beforehand so what they presented to us we just assumed that's what was going on that's what had happened and it was as we went on and on and on and um things didn't seem to be moving forward and there seemed to be no progress. Then we started questioning a lot of things. So uh, the lawyer, Imran Khan, was writing to the police asking for updates and to find out what was going on. And he would get nothing back, just hear nothing back. So, and, and these, these were the days like for, before faxes and things. So he was fax, fax a, a request through, hear nothing back, would telephone, nothing back, would write a letter, nothing back. And that's when he then came to us as a family and said, look, there's, there's something going on because I'm, I'm requesting bits of information. I'm trying to find out what's happening, the timeline of things, and no one's letting me know. When did you, you just get the phone call about Stephen? So it wasn't a phone call. So we was at home waiting for him to come, and it was one of our neighbours. So where I lived in the housing estate, there were, there were houses that were at the back of our house, and there were houses like along the side. So it was one of our neighbours that lived behind the back where we lived, called Joey Shepherd, that came with his dad and knocked on our door and said that he thought Stephen had been involved in a fight. And then my parents got in the car and went down to the roundabout to find out what happened. And how's that then? Like, were you there? Yeah, yeah. So I, 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 cause I thought Stephen had lost his key and that the knock, the first knock at the door was him, which was about 20 past 10. So I went running downstairs, opened the door and I was like, and it's like, oh, is your mum and dad home? And I was like, yeah. And they went, oh, okay. So I went up and got my mum and dad and I sat up the stairs and heard the conversation and saying, Oh, we think Steve, Joey's just been at the bus stop, seen Stephen involved in some sort of fight. We don't know what happened because Joey got on the bus. We think you should go and find out what happened sort of thing. So, yeah, um, they jumped to the car. I had to stay at home because I had my younger sister and, and off they went. Who was that though when your mum and dad came back? <sighs> yeah. Um, so my, my dad's 6'3", so he's quite a big guy. So as a child, I always looked up to him He's quite a scary guy, you know, uh, being so tall and so big and stuff. And, yeah, he, he, he was in absolute bits. Couldn't really speak. Um, all he could say to me was go and speak to your mum upstairs. And I went upstairs and spoke to my mum, and my mum told me. And, uh, yeah, it was just crazy. Like, um, didn't believe it. Really angry, really confused. Um, just a bit of a loss, really. But I came around to the realisation that if I went to school, that someone would know what happened and know the people that did it. So I, I went to bed, I got up the next day and I went to school. You went to school the next yeah. day? To try and see if you could get information? Yeah, because I said, I saw where, where it happened, another 100 metres was where Mark Winters lived. So from the age of about 14, every Friday, Saturday night, I used to go to Mark Winters' house, we used to have a little teeny bopper rave, and stuff so i walked up and down that road hundreds of times there was a cinema like 20 meters away from the bus stop I went to that cinema hundreds of times as a kid so i knew the area i knew people around in and around the area so i knew someone would know um so yeah i, I went to school and we got the names we got the names quite early on during that day um and i went home and told my parents thinking that would speed the process up and allow the police to do the job that they were supposed to do and for us to have some sort of closure and move on from it. Yeah, so the five names, who I've got the five names, was it Luke Knight, the Accord, was it Accord Brothers? Yep. Uh, Gary Dobson and David Morris? Yep. And that's the five names that were thrown into the mix straight away? Yeah. 
but then it only it took nearly twenty years to get a conviction of to like that process like because your mum seems like such a strong woman uh, if, if probably not your mum then it would have probably been swept under the carpet away long ago where it would have probably been forgot about like your mum's just kept banging the drum and kept banging down doors to get answers and that for me is a strong woman I've watched so many interviews about your mum and it's unbelievable what she's actually yeah. to done with getting Nelson Mandela involved and that's listen that's unbelievable for a local case to then go taking it international is a whole different ball game like the more you shed light on things the more people then take note and that's the important thing but when the five names get thrown into the mix straight away, like I, I even seen a video of those guys a year later when they're not in a room and they were pretending to kill somebody and do the violent acts, had a knife and shit like that. Like the first year of that, how hard was that for you and your family? It it was surreal. It was surreal. Um because like I said, like so there's a program called The Bill. I don't know if you remember the Bill. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so that's the program I got brought up on. You know, a crime happens, the police get involved. They do their job, the person goes to prison. Like, that was a process in my mind. So, when we kept, they got the names and gave the names, and then the names came from another source as well. So, someone that we knew uh, also was told the names, and he reported it to the police. Uh, and then we later found on that someone went actually into the police station, gave the names in, someone went on the phone, gave the same names as well. So, when all these things were happening, we were just like, well, why is it not? Why, why is not nothing going on? And then sort of like the, the rumours and the, the, the narrative started to change with that Stephen was a drug dealer, he was a gang member, uh, you know, he was up to no good, so therefore these sort of things happen to these type of people. And it didn't matter how much we as a fan were saying, no, this is not true, it's not, no one was believing us. And it wasn't until we met Nelson Mandela that came through um, a few of the, the, the political groups. So the, there was one called the Anti-Nazi League, um, that helped us organise that meeting. And, and it, that's what I believe really sparked the momentum change when we sat down with Nelson for two hours, explained to him what happened. And he came out afterwards and said to the press that he knew and understood that black lives never amounted much in South Africa, but he didn't think they'd be the same to be of Great Britain. And that changed the narrative of the media. So the weeks afterwards, it was Stephen was an A-level student studying to be an architect that was killed in South East London. I think a week after that, the boys were arrested for the first time and questioned. And 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 for us as a family, it's like, finally, like we're, we're getting some momentum now. We're, we're moving things forward and hopefully we'll get a positive outcome. And it then didn't go like that. It just didn't, didn't work out like that. And then we had... Uh, the investigation so the first case collapsed uh, through the evidence uh, they were saying that because Dwayne was compromised when he gave his ID parade that the evidence there was no sufficient evidence they never had no clothing no DNA no weapon nothing it was all based on his testimony so when that fell through we were just like right this is this is never going to work like what are we going to do next and um you know, my, the, the legal team thought that they could go for a private prosecution so to take on the case themselves and try and prove um, what had happened. That was unsuccessful as well. And then once we got through that hoop, we were just like, right, it's, it's over because you can't try someone twice for the same crime. So we were just like, right, what are we going to do now? And, and we pretty much thought that that was it, it was over. We then moved into the case of trying to find out why the police never did the job properly and that came through the first report and the inquiry then and then it wasn't until after the first report that we then had the double G jeopardy law change that gave us a bit more hope of, of things are going to change and then that's when clive came into the picture yeah so once they get acquitted for the was it a second time so for the, no for the first time so first so they can't they couldn't get you know they couldn't get tried tried again. again yeah was well, because they were acquitted now. yeah so they obviously must have thought right it's over but yeah. again was there not a, when you've done the private investigation, was one of the undercover police officers not say there was a smear campaign against you and your family? Yeah, but the smear campaign started from day one, I believe. Like we had um, police liaison officers in our house who were reporting back to the police about who was in our house, what they were doing, what they were saying, um, which I thought was a bit weird. Like, why, You're there to support us as a family. You're not there to report back to the police. And we was being very open to the police from day one as well. There wasn't a case of me saying, no, we don't want the police involved. You can't come here. My parents were like, come in. Like, what, what can we do to help? How can we help? How can we ensure that things run as smoothly as possible? So one of the th things that were key as well was like, that there was no violence. 
you know, in all the all Stephen's friends and peer group, very angry at the time because this was a third murder in South East London as well, a third of a, of a person of colour being killed. So there was lots of anger going on, and my parents were very adamant that there should be no acts of violence. Like that's not going to help no one. That's not going to push things forward. Let the police do their job. If anyone knows anything, let's help and support the police. So we were very supportive of the system in the beginning parts. And it wasn't only until we realised that that support and that help wasn't being reciprocated and wasn't being appreciated that we then started to feel like we had to do something a bit different. Yeah. How hard is that though for like your mum, your dad, when you see go through those court cases? Because you never even got legal aid, did you? For You had to raise your own money yeah. to fight for your own son's convictions yeah but again they were doing it because they 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 they, they had no other choice it, it wasn't a case of my mum and dad having this great political drive of understanding or dro understanding the system and going do you know what we're used to fighting against this therefore we're just going to do what we usually do this is all new to my parents like they, they weren't in this world beforehand and my mum always said that she wasn't going to allow Stephen's death just to be a statistic or just to be like something that was just passed off of just something just happened, that she was going to find out what happened. She was going to get the answers that she wanted and she wasn't going to stop until she got those answers. That then becomes a problem for the Met. Well, they didn't think it was a problem. At the beginning part, they honestly didn't think it was going to be a problem. Yeah. Um, from, their, from their attitude, from the, the, the things that they said and did, they didn't ever think that uh, she would or was going to get the help and support that she did get. But that's a murder that changed the nation. Yeah. You must be proud of your mum. 100%. Like, she's like she's for an <laughs> absolute warrior. Like. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I tell people all the time that it's hard to, to be to live in her shadow and try to, <laughs> to, to make her proud because she works so hard and she's so driven and determined mm -hmm. to do things. So that's really hard. So the standards of what is what is good and what is acceptable is extremely high in my household. But it drives me forward. It keeps me determined. It keeps me focused and honest. It really does. How can you live a, a kind of normal life when something like that happens? It's it's all over the, the world news eventually, like what has eventually happened. Like how can how does that affect you going to work or relationships or whatever? Like obviously it will still play a massive effect. Like I've lost family members yeah. and friends to murder. I know the pain and the struggle, what it's like, and it never goes away. So yeah. for yourself, it had such a high profile case. How do you move on, especially if there's no convictions, especially if there's no closure? Could you ever really move on or did you try and block it out? How did you deal with it? So my parents did a really good job of, of allowing me to be a child. So I was 16, I just about to do my GCSEs. Um, so they were very adamant from the beginning that media interest of me and my sister should never be publicised. But if you go back and look through all the footage and stuff, you'll see me there. So, you know, every major event I'm there, but the press were pretty good allowing me, not naming me and, and putting me on front pages and things, which allowed me to have some sort of childhood and to be able to be some sort of normality. Um, so, you know, after Stephen died, I went to college for a year, Woolwich College. And what I then did is I had a habit of going to somewhere in a new place, not telling people my back history of who I am, because I wanted people to know me for Stuart. Um, and then as things progressed and moved on for me getting to know people, they would then find out little bits and pieces or see me on the news. Or, and go, oh, I saw you on the news. Like, with this, is, that, is that your brother? And, and put things together and then find out who I was, which I preferred. So I did that for, I'd say, through, through college, uh, did, I redid my GCSEs, I did my A-levels, the same thing for two years at Elephant Castle. And then for three years at university, I left London, I went to Northampton, the same sort of thing as well. And only the people that were really close to me would know and everyone else, I, I wouldn't feel the need to tell them. Um, so that's how I sort of protected myself a little bit. But then I realised now, later on, that that's not a good way to live your life, just you know, meeting people and then cutting them off and, and disappearing. Um, especially now that I've got my own son myself, like I, I really want to introduce him to them some of those people that I, I had along my journey and my, 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 like who people I worked with, the people I went to college with, like just to meet them and talk to them about how I was at that age is something that I really am interested in now. Um, but that's, that's what was, I found that that was my coping mechanism. Now mm -hmm. looking back, that's the way I coped, um, which helped me, but it wasn't healthy really yeah. to keep on doing that so now i'm a bit better now with it all 
about talking about it um, and letting people know and explaining the things I've been through and, and how it made me feel. But that's taken time to be comfortable enough to do that, yeah. I suppose, as well. Because then you become the light for the other people that's maybe stuck in the darkness. Like, yeah. Even just sitting in your presence, you've got a great energy. You can yeah. see you're a good guy. Great family behind you. Like, I think I read a stat, I actually read a stat last night, that like, half the murders in London are the black kids. Yeah. And only 13% of the population as black kids so the stats is, is very high so yeah it's it's sad like but it never used to be a thing it never used to be a thing it's this is this is the only thing i'd say since i think about 2000 i want to say 2004 2005 it started to become a thing where black kids were murdering other black kids before then it was never a thing yeah um and that's why i tried to advocate now and go out and speak to young people because Lots of these young people are doing things and not understanding the consequence and the knock-on effect and how these things live with you for life. And it doesn't just affect you and your little bubble of your friendship groups or the, the arguments you're having between another group of kids. They've got family and that ripple effect then goes out wider. So I have a son myself now. He will have to carry the burden of Stephen's murder and know about it and people, other people know about it and want to talk to him about it that's that he 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 will never understand or know life with, with Stephen and have that experience and that exposure or have his cousins that maybe Stephen could have had all those little bits of pieces that people at the moment don't understand the consequences and that's what I try to do now just try to let people know that life is precious every day is, is a blessing and and try and maximize that day and, and conflict with other human beings isn't our mission isn't our purpose of being here yeah obviously you read the, on the news you see all the crimes in london like i spend a lot of time in london now and it's became a, a big piece of my heart like i love it i've been in battersea i've been in brixton and i'm welcomed so much like the, the food is amazing the people are great the culture everything about it like it's a great place yeah, it is. you just hear about the bad shit consistently and that's the sad things but there's so many good people in there who help the kids, who help the homeless, who do what they can to make it a better place. You do, I don't think you hear about it as much, which is sad. But that's the news though, isn't it? We, we don't yeah. have the good news, do we? It's not constant good news. It's just about doom and gloom. It's about the the, the more extremity of life that mm -hmm. we hear in the news. And that's why, again, it's it's only that we only hear about those the negative side, which is which is bad because there are so many good people in London. There are so many good kids in London as well that are doing good things and trying to be the best they can. And, it's the small minority that are making it seem like something really bad for everyone. And I think that that's also what feeds into the idea about knife crime, about youth violence, that there's an idea that everyone's at it. All the kids are carrying the knives. All the kids are, have got this violent thing where they want to hurt each other. When it's not, it's a small majority. And if we can get to that small majority and get the, the masses to understand that they carry a bigger weight than the small majority then hopefully we can start to turn the tables on it a bit more. Yeah. Well, Glasgow was the murder capital of yeah. Europe for yeah. many years. It was, it was. Do you know what I mean? It's not yeah. just... Um, it's people of all different colours who do bad shit as yeah, well. It's 100%. not... I just feel as if it can be targeted that um, young black kids, it's them, it's causing the trouble. It's no, them, it's doing the murders when it's really... It's fucking everybody. Yeah. It's just the standard of living is poor and just that's what I was to say it's deprivation it's yeah. social mobility it's, it's prospects it's opportunities when you when you wake up every day and the first thing you've got to think about is how am I going to eat today am I going to have to have the electricity on and that's your main concern and worry as an adult and not whether what's my child going to do today how am I going to make them the best individual how am I going to facilitate them to go to these different clubs and these different experiences if that's not your first thought then it's, it's, it's all messed up, isn't it? And, and then school becomes an environment where that's where they look after children and that's how the children are grown and brought up when really and truly the family at home have to play a part in that as well. And but if the family at home is always working and worrying about how to pay the bills and the cost of living, all these different extremities of life, they make it really difficult for you to focus on your children yeah. and bringing them up and making them the best versions of themselves to then go and support the community, which then supports the country, that supports the world. Mm -hmm. See, when you were going through the 17 years before the convictions, like, how hard was it to see documentaries, to be in newspapers, to see those guys, like, skipping away from court and kind of making fun of the system? How hard is that for you and the family? Like, 
you probably thought this is never going to happen. No, it, it didn't. He didn't because again, it felt like every single time that we thought we've got them, we're, we're, we're ahead of it. They, it, it got to the final stage, and it just felt like they were two steps ahead of us all the time, and they knew more bits of more information than we did. Um, and as I said, that that's that. Hopefully, now in years to come, that will come out about the undercover policing, the police corruption, and all the leakage that we had around the case will come out, so people can understand because. Lots of people presumed, until Murder Came, that changed the nation, that documentary came out, a lot of people presumed that we would be in difficult as a family, that um, the police were doing the best job ever, and we were just complaining and moaning about it all the time. And it wasn't until that, and the, the Mark Daly one, where the, he did the undercover police officer stuff as well, and it just showed the country, really, the, the other side of the coin, that, hold on a minute, like there's these people that believe and, and act like this in the police. That wasn't thought of beforehand. And now that we had the evidence, video footage, tape footage of people saying things and acting a certain way, that's when gay, gay people a better understanding that, hold on a minute, there's something not quite right here. Maybe these guys were twirling the truth and people weren't doing their job to their best of their abilities. Mm -hmm. Did you know any of the, of the five before the murder? No. no. Were they from that area? Yeah, so they, so again, so like I said, Mark Winters' house was, was 100 metres around the corner on Rochester Way. And... Um, so I was in that air, in and around that area quite a lot. There was a model car shop in Eltham, which I used to go to quite a lot as well. Um, so I was in and around Eltham quite a lot during the day. Never bumped in, bumped into them, never heard of them. But but I am I was because I'm two and a half years younger. So I, I find sometimes certain things happen in certain age groups. So they were known in that age group. So that's sort of eighteen plus age group. People knew them as a gang of boys in the in and around the area. But I never, I never knew them, never met them, never bumped into them once. Did one of them not stab another black kid just a couple of months or a couple yeah. of weeks before that? Yeah, so we got to find out. Yeah, so, so like I said, they were quite prolific in the area. So there was an incident at a kebab shop. Uh, a black kid was in a kebab shop ordering some food. Uh, I think they came in and asked him what they were, he was doing in their area. And, and there was a bit of a confrontation. And as he left, there was a, a bit of a fussful and yeah, when he got stabbed. Uh, just once, and then he ran off and, and managed to survive, yeah. What was the evidence against him? So, and this is this is the heart, but so before we get to the evidence part, what needs to be known is that they were being surveilled, the surveillance was happening on them. So after Nelson Mandela, they started to surveil them, the, the, the boys, and there's pictures of them taking black bags from a house to the back of a car. Three or four times this happens. And then the car, someone, one of them gets in the car and drives off. Now, the people surveilling him has a decision to make. He can either follow the car or stay where he is. Now, he decides to stay where he is. Now, for me, as a curious cat, I'm like, well, what's in the back bags? What's in the car? Why not follow that and find out what happens to that? But he decides not to. And then the evidence that we find is the, is the clothing that was taken from after they get arrested after six weeks. So they get arrested after six weeks. They go into their houses. They ask them what they were wearing. Clothes are taken and put into evidence bags. These evidence bags are then stored in Deptford Police Station um, and for the duration. So uh, Deptford Police Station closed in 97, 98. And this is when Clive Driscoll took over the case. And as the police station is about to be closed, these evidence bags are about to be thrown away. And one of the police officers says to Clive, what do you want to do with these evidence bags? Should I just throw them away and the rest of the skip with the rest of the stuff? And Clive goes, no, send them to long-term storage because you never know what might happen we might be able to find something a bit later on down the line. So the stuff gets sent to long-term storage. Now, technology moves forward, time moves forward, and basically the, this, the microscopes that they have become more powerful, are better at finding different bits and pieces, and the evidence that's found in the, on the clothes, in the bag of the evidence, are, are, are speckles bits of blood, and... Um, they are able now to use the speckles of blood and to, to use the magnifying glass to, to analyse it, and it's Stephen's blood. So then what happens next is they've got to then, uh, they do DNA tests on all the boys, they do DNA tests on all of us as family members as well, trying to make sure that the blood is found is Stephen's, it is, but it's so small that it could sit on the top of a human's hair. That's how small the particle bloods are. and But that's what convicts them, basically. That's what you could make you get a retrial with the new technology yeah. the new evidence yeah. where i believe that was it hair and blood no no so it was the hair uh was their hair was encased in stephen's blood 
on the clothing. So one of the, one of, one of the bits of evidence was a coat, and the other part was a, was a pair of jeans. And uh, the coat has, under the lapel, uh, encased in one of their hairs, the blood was encased in, the, in under the lapel. Uh, and then on the jeans, there was uh, specks of blood on the jeans as well. So this is in 2010, nearly 20 years later. Yeah. Was your mum giving up hope at any time? Uh, I think we we had decided after the last private prosecution case that we, we had to try to do ourselves that the possibility of having any convictions was nil to none. Like We were just like, well, it's not ever going to happen unless someone confesses because we didn't think the evidence was ever going to be there. Um, so, yeah, we, we pretty much had come to the, the, the thought of we're going to never give up, but we, we're quite mindful that unless one of them confesses, it's never going to come true. So when your mum, got, who got the phone call to say that there's new scientific evidence? Was it your mum? Was it, was it Khan as well? Was he still the lawyer? At yeah, the time? so Imran Khan has always been the li- yeah. lawyer. And by this time now, my mum and dad have split up. So there are, there are two different lawyers and, and two different um, families to notify. So Clive notified my mum. And I think my dad might have been living in Jamaica at the time, so he notified uh, his lawyer, and then phone calls were made and stuff. Yeah, was there break up the stresses and pressures of yeah, your brothers? There, I can only put it down to that. Yeah, so this was about two years after Stephen passed away. They they they, they split up, um, and I can only put it down to that. You know, it's it's um, grief is is a, is a hard thing for anyone to go through, and everyone's grief is individual and how people deal with things and want to deal with things again on an individual basis. And yeah, I just feel like the strain of everything, the press, the media, um, the, trying to keep the momentum going, um, trying to live life. They still had two kids to look after as well. I just think it just got too much for, for them both to, to deal with. And yeah, they decided to go their separate ways. Is that an extra added bit of pressure on yourself to try and, live us like a normal life uh, i said to them at the time like i was 18 at the time so i just said to them like georgina would have only been 13 i said to them like just try and do your best with georgina i, I had 16 years of utopia of you know a perfect little life where everything was good and i just wanted to try and give my sister as as much of a normality of life as possible um so i just said to them like to focus on her like i was i was just about to go off to university um I knew where I was going, what I wanted to do, whereas she didn't. So, yeah, I, I just just said to him, like, look after her, focus on her, mm-hmm. like, and I'll just carry on doing what I've got to do, and, and I'll dip in and dip out of life as much as I can. Yeah, you seem very level-headed, brother. Like, <laughs> your brother, like, no doubt Stephen would be proud of you. Yeah, like, you've got so. your head on your shoulders. Like, a lot of people that could turn into vengeance and, and hurt and rage. Like, you're very understanding towards the system, which a lot of people would be sitting here effing and blinding yeah, towards no, the um, system. But you seem to understand it and go, Do you know what? You've you've not just accepted that. You've, you know what it involves. You know what it takes. But you know that you can't quit in life either. No, you can't. And one of the momentums of life that kept me going through was asking what Stephen would want me to do, how he'd want me to act, what type of person he'd want me to be. And bitterness and anger and revenge are, are, are great things to think about and, and to try to get your head round. But they, they, their bitterness, their, their anger, that, that hate that can only go one way and make you a bitter, hateful, angry person. And then what kind of person would that be for my sister? So I wanted to be trying to be the best role model and the best big brother I could be for my sister. And if I was going around spitting vengeance and anger, then that's what she would do. Yeah. And that's that's no way. I'm, I'm not from that world either. Mm-hmm. I say all the time, like, what am I supposed to do? Like, to all of a sudden go into some sort of gang. I'm not from that world. I don't understand it. So therefore, what what can I what can I do? Try to do to to be in it and that wouldn't be the way to honour my brother's death, like to then find my end up myself in prison, criminal record and all that stuff. No, I'd rather try to be a positive, try to be uh, the shining light of hope and optimism of what life can be for people, even though you can have something so negative. So one of my favourite things to say, but it's not where you start, it's where you finish in life. Like that for me is a great momentum builder and a, a great driver. Like what can I do? How can I help others to be something different in life by showing them and giving them a little bit of example of what's happened to me in my life. Yeah, very noble, brother. So 2010, 
did you, your mum had to meet with Cant to then go to court and try and present new evidence to then try and get a retrial? Well, no, because they, what happened then is CPS took over. Um, Who's that? The government. So the government's lawyers were now going to retry the case against the boys, or against these two boys. Mm -hmm. Um, and so Imran's, all Imran's job was to do was to facilitate and to give us over as much evidence and stuff that they had found out to try and help support the case. Um, so yeah, so that was what the, the, the so they, they announced that they were going to charge the two guys to us. Um, one of them was in prison. One of them was, was out about still. So that was a bit of an operation to try and, um, as he was being released to, to rearrest him and to send him back inside and to go and find the other one that was out and about and to arrest him. So they did that. And then, yeah, the momentum started for the case. So that was Dobson and Norris. Yeah. 2010, one was in prison for drugs. The other was out and about. Like when you eventually got two people charged for the murder of your brother, how was it? Was that a relief for you and your family? Were you thinking it's going to go through court again? It's going to be another not yeah. proven or acquitted or whatever? That, that, were you yeah, thinking that again? Yeah, definitely, 100%. I didn't have any hope that they were going to be convicted. I didn't. But like, I, I'm a firm believer if you go with, with the worst case scenario in your mind and something positive happens, then that's the best outcome I can possibly have. So yeah, definitely was just like, it's not going to happen. It's just another, uh, we're just going to go through the process again. Hopes they're going to be held really high. We think we're going to get some sort of positive outcome and it's not going to happen. So I was just like, I'm just going to go for it. I've, I'm, I'm just going to go through this knowing that it's not going to have a positive outcome. Um, so I managed to get time off work and, and go to the Old Bailey and, and be at the trial every day. I was fed up of being told information secondhand constantly. You know, um, I want to be there for myself and hear it and understand it and absorb it for myself. Um, and then that was, that was great as well for me as to, to, to understand the levels and the layers of all of this, all this time thinking I knew stuff as well and not really knowing and understanding stuff. Um, and yeah, that, that, that again, like I said, we, we went through the whole process and when it, the, the, the jury was sent out to, to go and find a verdict, we thought we'd be there for the next six, seven weeks, maybe, maybe eight weeks at max for them to deliberate. And, um, yeah, I think it took them uh, three or four days. I think we was there. You are thinking that was a negative? Yeah, straight away. Because it's like, how can you come to a conclusion so so quickly? Like, we've been here. I think we've been there like months. It felt like we've been there for like a good three or four months, hearing evidence, hearing testimonials from both sides of the arguments. And I just thought to myself, like, at least four weeks they would need to deliberate, go through everything. But no, it was like three or four days. Um, and they came back with a verdict. Yeah, how was it reliving that being in the courtroom to hear everything in small detail of how your brother died? That that shit ain't easy. Like, how no. did you deal with that? So the, the only day I walked out was when the um, forensic person was going through the actual wounds and stuff. That that sort of stuff I don't need to hear and just be reminded of. I just I just didn't feel the need to go through that side of things. And when they were showing. Uh, the the lab pictures and stuff like that. Just, I don't I don't need to see my brother like that. Like mm. I, I prefer to have the memories and the 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 visualization I have of him in my mind of him doing things with myself and and how much we enjoyed our time together. So that was hard, and but I definitely didn't want to go and see none of that. But it was again, it's it's really lethargic in some sort of way because I spent a lot of time people telling me things or or seeing documentaries or reading stuff in the newspaper. Uh, so it was good to hear from people the, the, the truth or the, 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 what they versions or their versions of the truth firsthand. Um, so that gave me a lot of satisfaction of, of hearing things and knowing things for myself. But it was hard. It was hard. It was hard. And, and I wrote every single day of the trial. I, I, I journaled quite a lot. And so every night I went home and I wrote. I wrote down how I was feeling um w w what i went through and all those sort of things i did just to try and get it out as mm. well do you find that that was your therapy and your escape to put into paper so you're yeah. as if you're talking to someone yeah 100 percent. i have not looked back over it like i've got about three or four books and i have not looked over them but but i just know it's not in me no more and i've, I've let it go to some sort of extent because if you don't, then you carry these things around you. It affects your relationships. And I, I, one thing I definitely know is I don't want it to affect my relationship with my wife and I don't want it to affect my relationship with my son, like in that sort of level. And 
my son's now 10 um coming on to 11 really really soon going to secondary school and th there's a conversation i've got to have with him that i just it's a hard conversation to have like he's gonna be going to school where other people are going to be telling things about his family and about him and he's going to have to somehow stand up and, and defend and talk about it and to be the voice of no this is what's happened this is the truth because there's still people out there that spout ridiculous things about my brother now like they, they, there's still comments about him being a drug dealer and being a gangster and you know i know this for a fact because he dealt me drugs and you know I, I saw him in all these different things lots of people still say those negative things about my brother which is hard yeah but it doesn't matter what you are or what you do even if he wasn't it doesn't give anybody the right to take his life no do you know what i mean yeah, but yeah. How was it sitting in court with the two people who killed your brother? Um, hard, really, really hard because you've got to remember as well, like they've, they've carried their lives on. They've got kids themselves. They've been able to live life and, and to, to experience different things that, that Stephen never got to experience. So that's hard to see them in that context. Um but what I, I don't try to do is I don't try to give them any relevance or any any presence in life and in my world um, because I, I feel like when you talk about people and say their names, like I don't even say their names, I don't say their names because if you talk and say someone's names, that gives them presence in the world and gives them stature. So they, they are there are nobodies, they, they're, they're nothing in life for me. And um, yeah, and until they've understood what they've done and the consequences of their actions and the effect that it has had on everyone and, and arts for forgiveness then as far as I'm concerned they don't exist would you ever accept an apology from them would you ever if they came forward and says look I was young I was at that life and I thought it was cool to hurt people injure people like if they uh, says to you I'm sorry for my actions would you accept their apology I'd be open to hear it and I'd be open to, to understand their mindset of the time. I don't know if I'd be able to forgive them because I'm not putting that scenario yet. So therefore, I don't have to have that thought process. But yeah, even even the two that were convicted are still saying no involvement. It wasn't us. You guys have set us up. You know what I mean? But all those connotations. So there is no exception of guilt from them two, um, which I find really hard to, to accept. But they are who they are. They are yeah. who they are. They they decided to to live their life in this manner and to have this mindset. Um, I'll never understand it. I don't want to understand their mindset. And yeah, as I said, I'm, I'm just going to go and try and go forth and try and do the best I can to try and make the world a better place. Has any of the five ever tried to reach out or a, a secret note or pass a message on to say nothing like that? It's no. just all denial yeah, still and yeah. try to still shame your brother and yeah. finger like blaming yeah yeah nothing nothing no nothing at all um no and and, and again it's it's I, I, I yeah i don't even know how how i would accept or, or deal with that if they tried to do that like I, I yeah that would be really weird um because i said as far as i'm concerned they've always said that it wasn't them they had nothing to do with it you know life is a mad thing though that like people even like i've interviewed some bad men who's made people victims of their crimes and some of them have went in years and years and if something's happened they've come out and changed they want forgiveness they want think you don't know what is round the corner like for you to be even sitting even contemplating if they said sorry how would you you do it like that just shows you the kind of character you are like other people would just tell them to fuck off and <laughs> rot in hell basically do you know what i mean like yeah but again to get closure and to hold on to bitterness and anger and frustration it's just a poison for you that, that's just you yeah breaking down yourself and things like that can be difficult but again it shows you what kind of character you are to then go do you know what i would be open to it but forgiveness is hard but to forgive that you can then move on in life but that's such a difficult thing yeah. everybody struggles with it now much as i preach and try to become a better individual i still struggle to forgive but i know how giving other people love and forgiveness that then makes me a better person yeah. and more man to then go, do you know what? You ain't going to hold me in any fucking dis yeah, disease no, definitely. stress. No, definitely. And for me, I, the, the example I try to say to people all the time that I like to use is Nelson Mandela. So I found out recently that the, the prison wardens, 
that held Nelson Mandela, that did some horrific things to him. He invited them to dinner when it, on his release. And, I was, and, I, and for me, to, to, for a man to, to, to go, do you know what? I'm going to invite you around my house. I'm going to sit down and break bread with you. And I'm going to allow the past to be the past and our future to be something different just shows me as a person that maybe I need to do more. Maybe there's more about me that I'm not quite tapped into yet. If someone like, like that can do it, then why can I not? Mm. So, so that, that I try to try to use examples of other people who've been through other things similar to what I've been through to see how they dealt with it and how they become a better person. And, and Nelson Mandela is a great one for me to, to try and use for that example. Yeah, that's why he's respected all over the world. Yeah. I mean, that's why he was a leader, that yeah. people would follow him and do whatever that he said because he's leads by his actions. Exactly. But grief exactly. is a powerful thing. That yeah. There's no manual how to deal with no. grief. No. Everybody's different. Now, we can sit here and smile, but we could be still breaking and screaming for 100%. help inside. It's Definitely. like, it's not a thing that we've been conditioned to go through. I interview a lot of like, ex-veterans ex -veterans and stuff as well, and some of them were SES trained and biggest trained killers on the planet to do what they've got to do but yet they're broken inside you can train somebody from the outside to be strong but if they're breaking within then it's there's no manual how to fix that no, definitely it's just not. people say time's a healer but you adapt to the pain I believe 100%, 100%. Is, do you know what I mean you don't accept it you just adapt you learn yeah. to deal with the fucking trauma yeah. and that's the that's the hard thing but it's also the beautiful thing like I say you can help guide others to then not like for you to sit here and go, do you know what? I'm not going to go with vengeance or anger and go on a mad because that makes you no difference yeah. from the bad people in life. Yeah, do you know what I mean? No, definitely. So, definitely. when you got the guilty verdict 2011, how was that for you and your family? Um, it was, it was, it was a weird day. It was a weird day. So, we was around the corner, uh, me and a friend, uh, having lunch, and in fact. Um, just chopping it up saying like how many more times are we going to be coming to this place to have lunch before we get uh, to find out what happened and yeah we've got a text message to say that we had to come back to the, the old Bailey because um, we had a verdict and so like I said straight away I was just like oh my goodness like this is such a negative and I was worried about my mum and dad how they were going to take it um, and then sort of like the, the sort of roll on effect how was you going to move forward from this um, another sort of opportunity to, to have a positive outcome and, but not having a positive outcome and then yeah we went inside and, and um, we got the verdict that they were found guilty and I'll say to you all the time it, it does feel joyous to, to have that feeling because there was a sense of oh my goodness like we're being believed like it, it's it's come to a point now where they're saying what what happened what we thought had happened had happened um, but it's then like someone says to you well you haven't really won because that's only two of them. There's more than two people involved. So it, 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 it felt like, yes, we won, but we hadn't won. Better sweep. Better sweep. You know? and, and then the next thought that came after was just like, well, if we've caught these two and we've convicted these two, why can't we get the rest of them? Um, but it's evidence-based. There is no more evidence. Um, they, they tested all the clothing that they had, all the evidence bags of all the stuff that they collected during that time. There's no more blood speckles. There's no more black blood particles on any other clothing. So that, that line of inquiries is not there. So the only other line of inquiry is someone saying what happened mm -hmm. and telling the truth. Um, and that again, I'm, I'm, I'm not in any way, shape or form in any land of hope saying that's going to happen because the two that were convicted were, were asking for a retrial because they were saying it never happened, it wasn't them, the clothes belonged to someone else, they've never worn the clothes. Like, there were so many excuses given that, um, yeah, that there isn't nothing. Who was that then, asking for another retrial once they got convicted, are you thinking, so, but yeah. here we go again? Yeah, so, I, um, so afterwards, I got on a plane with my wife and my son, who would have been six months old at the time, and we just went to Spain for two weeks and just had some time out, just chilled out. And it was the last day. So I had a great time, unplugged from it all, you know, just slept, felt so much better, so much recharged, just about to come back. And the, and the day that we was coming back on the world, BBC World News, it came up that they were going for a retrial. Um, 
which again just felt like a, a, another dagger in the heart sort of thing. I was just like, when's this ever going to end sort of thing? Uh, so we packed ourselves up, came back to England, uh, spoke to Imran and his stuff, and he was just saying, look, we, that's just basic procedure. Like they, that was, he, they thought that was going to happen, and they were quite convinced that the, the evidence and the conviction they had was quite secure. And if they kept on pushing, really, then maybe their time could go up in prison rather than come down. Um, so yeah, that was that was quite good to know that. But again, it just felt like it. It just, it just felt feels all the time when we feel like we're moving forward that then someone puts the chess piece two pieces back and says, "Oh no, you, you haven't made any progress, really." Yeah. that's the way it feels. But the 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 the, the sentencing they only got fifteen years. Mm. Why? Because they're tried as uh, one of them was only seventeen at the time. I think he got fourteen years, three months. And the other one got eight, 15 years because he was 18 at the time. So they have to be tried as the minors or the age they were when that crime co was committed. Because potentially they should have got, what, 25, 30 years? Yeah, if so it was a modern, modern day status, yeah. So they'll be due out soon? Yep. Does yep. that play a massive part in your mind as well? Uh, I don't tend to think about it. Uh, I have been thinking about recently because we're getting towards the time. But the only good thing is they're on Her Majesty's pleasure. So there needs to be some form of admittance of guilt some form of omissance of changing a mindset or behaviour for them to be able to be released. So um, for me, that means talking and saying what you've done. So let's see what happens. Let's see if they then do fess up or hmm. they're not going to get released as far as I'm concerned. But God, what's the mysterious ways? Obviously, to not get more convictions, you obviously are saying a confession, but people carrying that burden, people yeah. carrying that yeah. guilt for yeah. so long that eventually people do crack. You'd be surprised. Obviously, you don't want to put your hopes on yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've never, even though you've got two convictions, there's still no closure for you. I can see that where somebody's not said, you know what? I've done it. I'm sorry. Um, please forgive me. Like, whether it happens, you don't know, but you, God does work in mysterious ways. Look what he done with the new um, technology to then create yeah, conviction. Yeah, no, definitely. So, I definitely. And people having that stress and, and pain for years and years and years, not knowing if their door's going to get kicked in every day because new evidence that, they would be they would be going through torment every day and rightly so do you know what i mean i hope so that, that's 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 all i can hope um because there are there are there are quite a few people that know exactly what happened on that night more than just the five people that were involved um how many people do you think were involved so i think there were six people involved in total um the gang is, is known as a gang of five but there was a sixth member that used to be on the peripherals that used to dip in and dip out um i think their parents know as well because we later found on that, that two of the boys have uh, parents who are in the gangland world so therefore they knew and were given bits of information and told certain ways to behave and things to say and not to say so i think they know and then they had girlfriends as well so there's another layer and so there's another six people that knew there as well so yeah i, I think there's a good sort of 20 people outside the five or six that know exactly what happened that night and have decided to to keep that to themselves. It's a lot of people. Yeah. And it's, it's surprising though that nobody ever did break. But again, it's that they were, they were prolific. They were notorious. And like I said, so I found out now afterwards that they were, like one of the dads were paying off the local police and they had a run. So they were exporting drugs around Europe. And they had a run from um, southeast London all the way to the ports, all the way into Calais. And it was called the, the, cocaine, the cocaine Drive or Cocaine Mile or something that they had, where they were just paying people off to have to write a passage to be able to do what they were doing. So like I said, people, they were absolutely feared in, in the southeast London area. So a lot of connections. Yeah, yeah. Did you ever? Did you or your family ever get uh, pressure put on you to stop? So we, we we moved after three or four months from the house in Woolwich because my dad's car got the knife uh, got the uh, tires got knifed a couple of times. Um, so we move ended up moving, and um, we didn't go back to the family home for a year and a half uh, because of it all. Um, but nothing other than that. Nothing other than that. But it's still sad that you are the victims, but yet 
more pressure to then try and silence you. Yeah. And the scary thing is a lot of people do get silenced. No. And I think, again, that's the reason why one of the sort of the 20 peripherals haven't been come forward. Fear. Yeah, 100%. Because I said they... they 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 operated in such a level that they were own they weren't only sort of like community level, but they also had were paying off police officers. They're all placed also paying custom officers of the office as well. So you don't know one of the police officers that you may be going to speak to may not be on the payroll. Yeah. Who was the man Sir who was it? Sir William McPherson? Yeah. And he came out with the statement that it was the police were instant institutionally racist. racist yeah like so there's this, facts there that we, we know that anyway there's plenty of videos out there that listen not all coppers are bad do you no, know what i mean yeah, you, you, every, yeah. everybody knows that but there's proper scumbags out there who are proper racist towards kids man and yeah. it's sad and it's scary to see that so yeah mcpherson coined the term institutional race by saying the institutions allow these people to have their racist behavior mm -hmm. and never be challenged and never had the questions around their conduct come into play. Um, and this was evident so through the, the whole thing about the CPR, like, or the, the first take it. Why would you not take it out? Why would you see two black kids and automatically think that there's some crime that's been committed rather than going, oh my goodness, someone's on the floor, they're losing blood, let me perform first aid. So they were saying the mindset of these officers were going, well, yeah, they, they are criminals, they're black kids. It's the time of the night, they're in hoodies. Yeah, they're, they're, they're involved in criminality. So it's, that's what McPherson said in 1999 to try and allow everyone to understand that the system was broken. And that's why the 70 recommendations were made to try and change the system in some sort of way to allow it to be better for everyone rather than just for a few. Yeah, the system's clearly broken, brother. Like, yeah. For everybody that's in the system, like, the, the rate of people who reoffend, uh, it's just sad. Like, the people in prison, there's no... They're just coming out worse. But prison prison isn't a, a system to try and rehabilitate people to make them better. That prison is just a place to, for us to put the people away and forget about them for a bit of time. That's what it is. To the money-making scheme as well. It is huge. You're 40, 50 grand an inmate per year as well. It's, yeah, it's, it's a huge. Money, it's slavery and prisons. Yeah, there is. And, and I think lots of people are, are misguided by... The, the fact about prison systems and the judicial system and then you know the, the the rate of so i was a school teacher for 15 years so, so permanent exclusions that is the bedrock of the reasons why people go down into crime and into these these worlds because if you're not allowing them to have a future to see where they could go and the possibilities of things that they could do and you're saying to them no you're, you're a bad kid you, you you've got no hopes and opportunities then if you bottle everyone together like that, then they don't seem like they've got any hope open opportunities. So they then for they do do the wrong things and they do turn to a life of crime, which then exacerbates the whole process of police, crime, prisons. Like it's, it's a vicious circle. And I just feel like if young people are given better starts in life, if we are able to understand why someone's misbehaving and can't conform and wants to be uh maybe violent or, or aggressive let's find out the reasons why for those things so there's something called ace trauma which they found that there's like seven or eight nine different sort of traumas that kids can go through and if they go through two or three more of these types of trauma it can reduce their life expectancy as an adult by 10 years they are more likely to go to prisons they're more likely to go on drugs so if we can solve the problem earlier on then the problems that happen later in life they won't happen yeah. So that's why I advocate so much for young people to have the best start, to go and speak to them and try and offer them something different in life. Yeah, I interview a lot of criminals as well, and I always say this, but every single one, there's a, there's a, there's a link. Every single one was bullied or abused when they are younger. Every single one. Yeah. That holding that gun or a knife, I believe, is because they're so broken. Yeah. It's because they're dealing with so much trauma that that holding gun or a knife is to try and protect them, even though they're so broken they don't want to feel pain anymore but then they inflict pain on the others because they try to protect themselves, which which is weird. But people, like I say, the people who hold the guns and the knife, I believe are the weakest. People always ask me the question, do you not get scared? I say no, because I see vulnerability. Yeah. And I actually break it all down and have a conversation with them. You can actually see the sadness. You can actually see the pain they're in. Yeah. Even though people are fearful of them, they've just projected that image. Exactly. To try yeah, and yeah, keep yeah. themselves yeah. safe. But I see all through the bullshit, which is... But, people just love to hear the stories as well and people can understand. That's why I always go back to the start of the guest to give people an understanding of what they've been 
as a, listen in life as well there comes choices 100% where you can and make choices you can and I think choices and that's what I say to young people like you don't feel like the choices you can make are so significant now but there's still some couple of things that you can control your attitude your effort level things that come out your mouth your actions there are things you can control but there's other things you may not be able to control where you live uh, where you go to school per se but then as you get older, so I think 16, 17, 18, 18, you can start making more choices about where you go to school, the type of friends you hang around with, the prospects you're going to go forth and go and do. So you can't continuously blame someone else. But in the early part, yeah, so other people are shaping them and pushing you in different directions. But as soon as you start to know what's right from wrong, and we all know that, I do believe that we all know what, what feels right or wrong from the, the reaction in your stomach, from the reaction from other people. And, and when you can start to feel that, oh, do you know what? I'm doing something good, keep on doing that. If it doesn't feel quite right and other people look at you funny, then don't do it. Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in that. How hard was it to, your mum made the decision to uh, bury Stephen in Jamaica. Do you think that was the right decision for yourselves to then, instead of the UK? Yeah, um, it was the right decision when you, when you look at things like the memorial plaque being defaced. It's, it's got a CCTV camera on it now. That, that watches it because it's been defaced so many times. It's the right decision when we had a building built in Deptford for the trust, um, Stephen Morris Centre, and within the first couple of weeks, the windows got smashed. So when you look at things like that, then yes, it was the right decision. It's not the right decision now because I want to go and pay homage and I've now got to get on a plane and, and do all that to go and pay homage, to go and, and to show Theo and to get Theo to have a better understanding. So that's hard. But but for the for I know why she did it. I know why she did it, and it, it does make some sort of sense. That's a fucking heartbreaking, though. What is people going through? What's going through people's minds to do that shit? Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, it's sad. That what's what makes the world a sad place. Like people who's going through enough grief and trauma to then having to take your kids over to a whole other country to bury them because the fear of people destroying the grave. Or, that's fucking sad, man. Yeah. It is. Um, but what I say to people all the time, like, it's, it's confusing and, 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 and weird when you think about it. But then I say, well, it's confusing and weird for us because we're, we're not that, of that mindset. Hmm. That would never cross our mind to do something like that. So therefore, we can't comprehend and understand it. So I don't try to give it too many layers of trying to get to understand why someone would do that and just go, do you know what? That's them. Do you ever ask yourself, like, the question, why me? Yeah all the time all the time uh, and when I was a lot younger I felt so again I, I guess I was a bit of a rebel when I was younger I, I did did some things I'm not proud of um, when I was growing up and I did start to feel like maybe this is punishment for these things you know we, we was good, oh, a good Christian family so I went to church every Sunday so uh, you get told like your behavior and your actions that, that God may be punishing you for, for, for not being true so I, I did think a long time that maybe this was some sort of punishment for all the things that I had done wrong previously in my life as a young person. Um, but then I also started questioning, well, hold on a minute. I, I did try to get arts for forgiveness. I did try to do the right thing by going to church. I did try to be a good person. But they sure that would give me some sort of kudos and some sort of light that I was trying to do the right thing. And I knew so many people and so many friends who never, ever went to church, never did those sort of things. And their life seemed to be okay. So, yeah, that was a massive question in my head for a long time. Nah, you can't put that burden on you, man. Like, I, I know you, the questions still arise, but yeah. what was your last, do you remember the last conversation you ever had with Stephen? Um, so, it's, 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 this is kind of a weird one, because like I said, so we, we shared a room together. Um, so, like any brothers and sisters, we would argue and fight and, and have different agreements of things. And I think that the, the disagreement was when I, uh, as a curious soul myself, we had um, a, a Walkman each, and mine broke, and he had his one. And I thought, if I, if I get his and I undo it, I can find out why mine's broken, and I can refix it. So I undid his one, trying to, and I could never put it back together again. I was only like 12 or 13 at the time. And um, yeah, that really pissed him off, really pissed him off. So we was going through some battles at the time. and uh, But we had sort of, sort of come to sort of recognition of going, do you know what? Cool. It's your birthday. I'm not going to be angry with you no more. We're moving on. Um, and yeah, as I said, I, I was the annoying little brother. I can definitely see that now. I can definitely see that. And um, yeah, we because we, we, again, that, that morning, 
uh, my dad has set us both down and said, look, your mum's coming home to the evening. Don't be late home. You know, make sure you come home safe from still Stuart, um, Stuart and don't be past 10 o'clock, Stephen. And we was like, yeah, definitely, because I'll be emptying my mum for three or four days before that. So yeah. that was the last thing that I remember us talking about and doing, like, make sure you come home on time. Mm-hmm. What about um, your mum now? How's your mum? Yeah, she's good. Working like a nutter still. Um, I say to her, I, I just want her to slow down a bit and just take life and enjoy some life now. Um, but yeah, she's good. She just just works extremely hard. Yeah, strong she does. Woman. Yeah, well, you can just see that. But I think maybe if she did slow down, then maybe that's when the thoughts then. Keep yeah, mine as well. maybe, maybe. But I, I just feel I, I say to people all the time, like she, I just feel like she deserves to have some time for herself, enjoy her grandkids, come see some of the world. Enjoy some of life. Yeah. You know, you've, you've done a good service. You've done good for, for so many others. you tried to help so many other people. It'd just be nice for you to take some time for yourself. Yeah. Um, so that's what I'm trying to encourage her to do at the moment, which is really hard. But. Yeah, man, a strong woman. But she showed people courage never to give up, never quit. And she went up against the system. Yeah. Which not many people do and survive. Do you no, know what definitely. I mean? Like, it's, it's scary like, what the lens people have to go to to then get some answers yeah she, but again I, I say to people she uh, she doesn't she didn't she didn't go oh my goodness i'm gonna have to fight the system like it, it, i don't think it ever crossed her mind her driving force was he's not going to be statistic he's not just going to be a name that people just say we are going to find out we're going to get to the root of where this comes from we're going to understand and we're going to also en- enable others not to go through the same thing that we went through as a family so I'm hopeful now that victim support is a lot better for people. I'm hopeful that the, the whole police experience is better for people. And all these things have come out through the experience that we went through as a family because I'd never want anyone to go through what we went through as a family. I'd, I want people to, if something horrific happens in your life, for you to be able to phone the police and to, to believe that and understand the system will protect and support you and to get your positive outcome on the other end of it all. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to, to deal with it and try and, See, the world, like my mum's lost two brothers to murder. So yeah. she lost her husband to leukemia and I was in a fucking mess for years. So I can understand the struggle that she's been through, but she still soldiers on. She still, now she's seen me in a good light and yeah. makes her proud that things, the dark clouds do pass. Like you say, we do adapt to the pain, we do adapt to the trauma, but life does go on. Yeah. It's how we deal with it. Like you say, you question it sometimes why, but these are the cards we've been dealt. Yeah. It's how we play them after exactly. that. It's down to yeah. us, but... Because Stephen was a very talented boy. He was not in a Denzel Washington for them. Yeah. So Did I read that? Yeah. 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 He, he, him and Elvin, uh, who's his best friend, they, they managed to get themselves in and around people and things that I now look back and go, oh, how, why? So they were both into graffiti. They were both into mm. hip hop. This was just on the cusp of hip hop in America coming over here. Yeah, Tupac Biggie. Yeah, Tupac Biggie, Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, NWA, Public Enemy, all those guys, Wu Tank, um, LL Cool J, Rakim, uh, all those guys. When they first came over to England, my brother and Elvin got to meet them. So they were doing graffiti jackets, jeans. Um, yeah, the words on Channel 4, they used to go there regularly. Concert tickets, they used to go to them, all things. So yeah, it was really weird that they found their ways into these sort of environments but they were just they were just on the cusp and loving the scene and just wanted to be in and around it as much as possible you must have been looking at the two pack and biggie kind of murder but and thinking again it's kind of the same it is and the timings as well i think one was killed in september one was killed in april as yeah. well which is really really weird both um, in the same year 18 yeah, months and your brother yeah, and stuff like yeah. you're thinking no conviction for that and you're probably thinking if they can't get a conviction las vegas cameras then you'd probably be thinking yourself that like, was that ever a connection to your mindset that but it, yeah definitely because again it's it's I, we never i never had any hope never had any hope um never because i said it just it just felt like every time like was like right yep yeah, this time we've really got a good case this time we've really got some strong things going in our direction it just it just manifested itself in not to be in and like it just left everyone scratching their heads going, well, why have we not had a positive outcome? Why has this not quite worked? And like I said, that, that's only come down to now the finding out of... So even down to McPherson, we're now finding out McPherson wasn't shown or he asked for all the evidence, all the information around Stephen's case. We're now finding out there was still stuff hidden from him 
and and that goes back down to people making decisions who made these decisions who said no no don't send them that stuff because as far as i'm concerned again these people are still being paid through their pensions through the public purse so why should they be given this money when mm. they're not doing or done the job they're supposed to do at the first place so much corruption around this yeah. case huh? there yeah, is but... we won't find out until hopefully i, I had an email um I think the start of last week. So there's two still ongoing cases, one for police corruption and one for to try and find out um, the undercover police stuff. So we're part of that collective around mm -hmm. the, the, the way that the undercover police operators mm -hmm. handle themselves. And yeah, we're not no further in finding out. And that's 10 years now that's been, that case has been going on. That's a long time. How was Dwayne? Who was with your brother? Yeah, um, he's okay. I, I don't really see him much. Um, but yeah, he's okay. He, he, he's a conservative uh, member now and, and doing his bits and pieces out in the, in the community. Because yeah. I imagine it must have been tough for him to then reliving that every day. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and he, he, I think the stigma around Dwayne is, is, is that he's always the chap that run away. You know, he because he, the the incident goes that he he saw them come across the, the roundabout. He heard them shout, "What, what, nigger, what?" Um, he told Stephen to run, and he turned and ran. And Stephen was like, well, "What am I running for? Like, what? What's going on? Like, I'm not running. I haven't done nothing wrong." And and yeah, so it was only when he he turned around to see to, to realize Stephen wasn't running with him that he went back and picked off Stephen off the floor. That then, like I said, 100 meters up the road, he then realized that Stephen had been stabbed. Yeah, it's a shame not to have that burden on him as well. Do you know what I mean? To yeah. then, but if you're seeing somebody run coming with knives, then you're thinking run. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? But that just shows you how ballsy Stephen was. Like standing his ground to five kids, yeah. man. Does that? Yeah. Does, you're thinking why are you being so strong? Well, no. But yes and no because again, that's who he was as a like. If he hadn't done nothing wrong, yeah. Then he's just like well you're not talking to me it's not me that's just not me you're referring to i'm i'm not part of this i'm not i don't know what you're talking about so yeah um but again it goes back to that whole thing isn't it if 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 he did run then he would be still here today probably like and, and that's the crazy thing i say to all the time it, it was just a, it's a game of chance life's a game of chances so like during the old Bailey trial, we found out the reason why the bus was so long was because a tree had fallen down. There was a massive um, lightning storm that knocked a tree down that then delayed all the buses, that put all the buses on detour. And he waited, the amount of time that he waited, he could have walked home. And, and, and it goes back to that whole sort of thing. So this is before the bus app, this is before bus timetables were on bus stops mm -hmm. and things. So it's just a game of chance sometimes of and a life of, you know, what had happened if he had walked home, what had happened if he had the bus, the tree didn't get knocked down. There's so many finite things yeah. that happened to... It's all ifs and buts. And yeah, definitely. Like, and that, but again, we spoke earlier, it's about these are the cars we've been dealt. Yeah, 100%. Look how much, how many lives that this court case has changed. Look at the system it's changed, getting Nelson Mandela involved, taking it global, that things have changed but they haven't changed that much because it's still going on and it, which is a sad thing but just before we finish up brother anybody that's maybe going through some trauma that's maybe lost a loved one through something as tragic as losing Stephen what advice would you have for them again I say grief is bespoke grief is so bespoke um, and everyone's personal experience through losing someone should be seen as a personal experience and there's lots of books and there's lots of remedies out there of how to deal with things. And I'm a firm believer that you take each day as it comes. However you're feeling in the moment, you're feeling in the moment. Talking to people is a great one for me. Um, and trying to find yourself around like-minded others that can help you and that can help you talk and to, to be able to, to go through what you need to go through. And don't ever give yourself a time limit and say, oh, this is going to be over in a year or, or, or six months or whatever it may be. Just allow yourself the time that you personally need to, to, to move, be able to move on and try and live your life as best you can going forward. Yeah. What about yourself, brother? What's your plans for the future? Well, yeah, so um, I'm, I'm just saying, so I'm, I see myself as a, a cup of optimism and hope. You know, I'm, I'm trying to do my bit around young people, and try to get them to understand that they can be anything they want to be in the best version of themselves. So I've wrote a book recently 
trying to encourage them, trying to give them some tools around helping them do that. Um, I'm going around to schools, community groups, workplaces to talk about equality, diversity, again, how people can be the best version of themselves as well, trying to change people's mindsets around different things as well. So I'm doing that. Um, I hope to be doing some more TV film work as well. I've got a great passion to try and write TV programs, documentaries and telling stories from other sides as well. So I should be getting into some of those in, in the near future. And yeah, just trying to be the best dad I can be, be the best husband I can be and try and enjoy some of life as well. That's that's my, my plan and hopes for the future. Yeah, you're a good man, Stuart. Uh, when's your book going to be out and where can people get it? So the book came out 1st of April. It's at Waterstones, Amazon, independent bookshops. Uh-huh. Yeah. What about links for social media if anybody wants to reach yeah. out job opportunities? How can people contact you, brother? So on Instagram, it's H-O-N underscore Stuart Lawrence and uh, Twitter, S-A-L-2-N-D. And I'm on Snapchat and Twitter and TikTok and all the same things. So just H-O-N underscore Stuart Lawrence mm-hmm. on most things. Brother, for Oops. coming on today yeah, and telling no, your story. Okay. Listen, I appreciate everything you do. Um, your brother would be proud of you. Thank you. And anything I can help for the future, man, just uh, be, get in touch, man. And anything I can do, like I say, I'll help, brother. But appreciate God it. God bless you, yeah, brother. Thank I look you. forward to seeing what you do for the future. Thanks very much. Thank appreciate you. it. All right. Thanks a lot.